Good afternoon. My name is Joy Davis and I am the Director of Communications, Community and Web for CSI National. I am also a Certified Construction Product Representative. And today I am hosting Trusted Advisor, the role of product representatives in construction. This free webinar is provided to CSI's members and to the members of our product representation practice group. Our speakers today are Fad Goodman, shown here with me, uh, I'm the one in the dress, and Paul Simonson. Fad, a CSI member, will be leading our Product Representation Academy this year as part of the CSI Academies. And Paul Simonson is an experienced specifier who has had a lot to say about the value of a true, as he puts it, golden rep to his business. Welcome, gentlemen. So one of the questions that often comes up in construction and that also comes up in CSI's certification study material, which is where all the questions in today's program comes from, comes from is do architects buy products? Paul, what do you have to say to that? Well, the answer would be yes, uh, but not for projects. I mean, I buy products every day, but on the other hand, we specify products for projects. We do not buy them. We are not the end uh, buyer. Now, this is how I always answer the question, Paul. No, they evaluate, they select, and they specify. Would you say that's accurate? That is accurate. I mean, we spend a lot of time when we're putting together our specifications to determine what we are going to specify. Uh, we look at it, make sure it's going to perform for the particular project that we are working on. I had a conversation this morning with one of my architect clients where we were talking about uh, the type of window to put into a project. We have a developer owner who wants to put in what I would consider a fairly economical product, uh, but yet we're working on a high-rise uh, apartment building, and I just don't think it's going to work at the top of this building, and we're making strong suggestions that they consider using a different one. So we're evaluating it. Again, it works fine on certain projects, but the particular product we're looking at for this particular project, we just don't think it's going to work. So we look at every project independently and look at all of our parameters on that project, and then we try to select products that are going to work for it. Pat, is there anything you wanted to add? You know, from a product rep standpoint, Paul makes a great statement right there. Um, we suggest. I would say they do a lot more than suggest. You know, architects are the ones drawing the roadmap for the products that we'd like to have on the job. And while maybe they don't buy the product, we can certainly be closed out of a project if we're not listed as an acceptable person on the product, on the job. So, now, again, knowing that architect, having that relationship is probably one of the most important parts of our business. Okay, well, as you've probably guessed, we're starting with the easy questions, guys. So when we're talking to product reps, what is the relationship they're trying to have with an architect? And you started to get into this, that. Well, you're exactly right, Joy. It's, it's important to have a personal relationship. You know, what you want from the architect is you want the architect to know how your products work, where they're available, what makes the most sense for their project. But if that was all there was to it, wouldn't you just hand them a brochure and be done? <laughs> if that was the case, they wouldn't need any of us. Uh, <laughs> then the internet would be just fine. <laughs> enough, marketing people, and Joy, I hesitate to say this with you on the line, marketing people sometimes don't tell the whole story. How many brochures have you seen, all the product reps that are out there and all the architects that are on the line? How many brochures have you seen that look more like um, more like an advertisement than a technical document? So it's important to have that face-to-face -face communication and that and that voice at the other end of the line that they can pick up and actually ask a question. Paul, well, I, I look at product literature, and believe me, the internet and uh, forspecs.com and, and a number of places that I go using search engines is a, is a tremendous friend of mine but it doesn't tell me the whole story. Uh, when I look at a piece of product literature that was done uh, on, I'll call it in a laboratory and in a vacuum someplace, 
uh, I need the rep to tell me how that particular product is going to work for my project in my location uh, with the parameters that we have. Uh, and a piece of literature doesn't always do that. Uh, it may say it's had 20 years of history, but we don't know where that history was. Uh, I used to have a lot of people come to me on, on roofing and say, this thing has been around for 20 years, worked well in Switzerland. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and I look out my window and I say, where out there does it look like Switzerland? Our environment is totally different. And it may work real well in Switzerland for 20 years, but is it going to work in Phoenix, Arizona in 120 degrees in the summertime? Uh, which doesn't happen in Switzerland. So this is where I need uh, people to really talk to and really know their business and know their products. And, uh, and I have to be able to trust what they say. Paul, the way I usually summarize this is the point of a product rep is to take all of that information available on the web and in the brochures and in all of the studies and turn it into a very simple answer to a very specific problem that a designer is having. Now, for those of you who are studying for the CDT or the CCPR exam, this is a direct quote that references this idea of trusted advisor and that that's sort of the underlying theme of all of the material you're studying. This idea that the point of a product rep is to be someone that we trust who will be able to help us solve a very specific problem. Now this particular quote was actually pulled out of CSI's LinkedIn group, which everyone who's a CSI member or a product rep is welcome to join. You can just find it on our LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn and search for Construction Specifications Institute, and it'll pop right up, and if you aren't a CSI member, I'll let you in. Now this is the Project Delivery Practice Guide, which is, as I said, this is the basis of our CDT and CCPR exam. Uh, the CCPR also uses the new Product Representation Practice Guide, which was just published. But everything in today's slides come in some way from this book, so please look it up if you haven't already. And as you can see here, it's referencing the honest and ethical dealings. Paul, at the risk of really getting you started, how do you feel about product reps who are less than honest or ethical, and how do you deal with them? Well, I try to tell people you have one opportunity to lie to me, uh, and once I find that out, you're no longer that golden rep or trusted advisor. As a matter of fact, you're just the opposite. I don't believe anything that ever comes out of your mouth. And uh, therefore, and I've known people and, and that are peers of mine who have eliminated products from their specification just because a rep lied to them. There was nothing wrong with the product, but the rep lied to them. And it happened to be in one part of the country. And this happened to be a national architectural firm and they banned the product from all projects all across the country, which I didn't think was right or fair. But on the other hand, it just leads up to being honest and ethical and the ramifications of not being honest and ethical uh, can go far and deep. So um, I, once I trust somebody to tell me what their product can do, and just as importantly, what their product cannot do, uh, you become what I consider that golden rep. When you get to that golden rep level, you become my go-to person. When I have a question about a particular product, and I do work all over the country, so I hit every environmental group there is. Uh, so what works in Phoenix may not work in Minneapolis. So we have a totally different environment, and I need to have people to go to to tell me what revisions or additions do I need to make to make sure that this particular product is going to work in the environment in which the project is going to be located, not in the environment I'm sitting in. So again, having that person who knows their products, knows what they can do, what they cannot do, and is going to be honest and forthright about it is, uh, goes far. And when I have that rep tell me, and I have a lot of them believe you that say, our product is not going to work in this particular environment. Uh, uh, raises a level of trust in me to keep coming back to them. 
Joy, I've got one thing I can add. Probably one of the nicest calls that I ever got in my life, one of the most flattering calls that I ever got from an architect was after I, I left the business for a short amount of time. I was outside the industry I was known for, and I got a call from an architect, a specifier at a large firm who said, I've got three different reps telling me three different things about this particular product line. I'm almost embarrassed to call. I know you're not in this business anymore. Would you outline the differences in these products and tell me what I can believe? Now, I wasn't going to make a sale from that particular day and that particular phone call. I wasn't even involved. I wasn't even talking about a product that I represented any longer. But again, I was flattered that I was thought of in that manner. And obviously, I did my best to answer the question. And certainly, the door was open to me for the product that I did represent the next time I went into that office with that kind of trust. So Paul brings up a great point. Every product has limitations. Every product has places it fits and it doesn't. And it's just as important for the specifier who has legal, contractual, fiscal responsibility for that job and the future of it for us to know what those limitations are and to give them the correct information so they put the right product in the right place. And there's room for all of us in this industry. And that's the one thing I think some reps forget. And to get to that golden rep, that trusted advisor status, you need to understand that sometimes the most important sale is the one you don't make. And Dad, I want to jump in on something you just said that uh, that many folks just don't understand or even don't know is that the architect who makes these product selections and specifies them has a legal responsibility to make sure that they're going to perform. And if they don't perform, uh, there's liability assigned to that. that the design professional will take in hand and the uh, architect who stamps and seals the drawings has personal liability, cannot hide behind a corporate shield. Uh, so that particular individual whom I'm doing work for, I need to look out for their interests also so that if I specify a product, I need to be assured that it's going to work in uh, where it's going to work uh, so that we're uh, doing, I'm always looking out for the benefit of the project. I'm also need to look out for the legal responsibilities in this litigious society that we live in. Adam Olson made the comment here, he typed in, integrity is key. And I, I think you're right, Adam. And the flip side of all this, Paul, and that, correct me if I'm wrong, a product rep who has maintained his integrity, who has remained ethical even under extraordinary pressure to make sales, should he leave the company he's working for, as so many of us have in the past five years, and start working for a new company, there's a very good chance that he will take some old names with him because people will continue to call him and trust him. Would I be right about that? That would be absolutely right. One of my uh, golden reps on a particular product lines. Now, I lived in the uh, in Dallas in the uh, 70s and in the early 80s and then relocated several times. Got run out of many cities. Uh, but there's a particular uh, product rep and personal friend of mine who lives in Dallas that I still call. Uh, and the chances are of him making a sale on my phone calls are slim. I still do work in Dallas, so those opportunities still exist. But um, but he's my go-to person on particular product line uh, that I just know he's going to tell me the truth, and he still makes the time for me. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to move on. Oh, go ahead, Pat. That, I'll, I'll make one comment about that for the product reps on the job. I mentioned I got out of the business for about 18 months. I went to a different product line, and then I came back with a different company. I have one project that I can point to in central Ohio where I have three different products, premier products from three different companies on one job because as it went through the design process, the planning and design process, as I moved from job to job, the, one of the first calls I got was from one of those architects, just like Paul, that looked at me as a trusted advisor. And he said, hey, what have you got that you'd like to put on this job? What do you have that would fit? And he trusted me enough to say, okay, here's where it fits and here's what you could use. So I physically had three different companies represented from a time when I got out of the industry for a little bit. Yeah, I just want to jump on, too, because I didn't really answer your initial question uh, about a a representative who may change product lines and uh, honesty and integrity will go wherever you go 
and uh, and that all of a sudden means that you're repping new product lines. I'm I'm listening, uh, where I might not listen to somebody else. So uh, that's a, that's an important thing. And uh, sure, if you change product lines, I, it also opens up, up those doors. Uh, it'll also close them if you're not honest and ethical. Yeah, I don't want to belabor the point further, but. It, Reps have to think about the things that they will take with them from job to job, and one of the most important and easily damaged is their integrity and how they are viewed. And there is so much pressure to not look at it that way, that you have to keep that in mind. That's one of the tools you have as a rep. And here's another marketing slide just for that. <laughs> <laughs> the new construction product representation practice guide, as I said, is in the CSI store. And it's the main basis for the CCPR exam. So how early in the project should you approach the design team, Paul? I'm going to say too early is too early. Uh, if, if you're getting involved in uh, during the program or programmatic or schematic design phases, uh, oftentimes architects are trying to figure out uh, the shape of the building, um, or adjacencies of different spaces and things like that, and they're not spending a lot of time yet thinking about particular products that are going on. Design development is a, is a better phase to approach an architect. Uh, it's, it's when the, uh, the building has taken form, they're now trying to figure out what products want to be there. Uh, and then I'm going to say if you wait until it's well, early construction documents also is a good time. If you wait until later in the construction document phase, it's probably too late. They, uh, that's the time where we're documenting all the decisions that have already been made. And uh, architects are pretty hesitant to change uh, late in the game because uh, this is what we call the ripple effect. Uh, making a late change uh, has a dramatic effect on adjacencies of different products and how they come together. So I'd say uh, design development, early construction documents is a good time to approach the uh, design team. TJ actually just typed in a question. How early can depend upon the product, doesn't it? Uh, yes wow. and no. Uh, I'm going to say that um, if we're talking about roofing systems early on, uh, let's just say uh, the architect's concern is roof, yes, we'll have one, um, and yes, it needs to keep water out. <laughs> uh, what that system's going to be, we don't know yet. Uh, if we're talking about closet depth waterproofing, uh, we may pretty much know. I mean, again, a lot of us have our own biases, and uh, I happen to be a particular fan of what I want to use on closet decks. And, uh, so early on, if I know it's a closet deck or if there's something above a parking garage, or, uh, I pretty much know what I, I know what I want to use and the suggestions I'm going to make to the architect. But uh, so, okay. I believe that it's it's a rep's job to be there before the project starts. You know, there's a lot of reps that I've talked to that said, "Oh well, I see something's bidding. I think I'm going to try to get in there." Well, at that point, most of the money's been passed through the architect and. I think that that's one of the most damaging times you can actually step in and ask for something. I think that if you're not there before the project starts, you're probably making the wrong move. And so like for somebody like Paul, you know, if he's talking about it, he's got a specific roof that he'd like to use on his particular building, it's my job if I'm the roofing agent to have talked to him about how my product fits and where it fits so that when he thinks about certain types of buildings, he thinks about certain types of roofs. If I've done my job, he'll automatically gravitate to what I've told him are the advantages because I've been able to point out that my roof on this particular building will give him the best fit. And, uh, now we do have a question here from Bill. How do you identify the stage of the project and whom do you contact? <clears throat> you directing that to me? We could talk about that all day, Paul. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I think you will be talking about that all day at the PRA, yeah. It, uh, this gets to something. Um, I sent an email out to about 50 specifiers to put together a handout I'm going to send out to everyone who's on this call of things specifiers wish product reps knew. 
and one of the keys that the big ones that came back was you had better understand where I am in this process. I expect you to know that part of it. And the, the, the specifier, yeah, and that's the important person for you to find out uh, who does specifications for a particular company that you may be looking at. They, many of them will do it in-house. Many will use a consultant like myself uh, who is at a house. I work for probably a dozen different architects around the country. Uh, I have peers of mine that work for hundreds of architects around the country. Um, so uh, if you go to, I'm going to just say a web, website called skip.com, S-C-I-P, uh, Specification Consultants and Independent Practice, there's a list of all the independent specifiers that were members of that particular organization. Uh, and ways to contact them. Now, that doesn't mean we all appreciate receiving a cold call. What are you working on? How can I fit in? Um, again, it's about developing relationships, and specifiers usually have their thumbs on uh, the pulse of a particular project and knowing where it is uh, is a good contact. But those of us in the consulting side are not the final decision makers either. We are making suggestions, again, well, they should have the architect of record is the one that's legally responsible for everything, so uh, they are the ones who are making final decisions. We'll make suggestions, but and backing up what Thad said, uh, getting the phone calls on bidding, saying I'm not in your spec, how can I bid on this project? It's not something that is very much appreciated. It uh, it's late in the game at that particular point. Decisions have already been made to uh, look at it and try to change something during bidding or even during construction substitution process. It's something that I hate. I can talk to all day about it. <clears throat> but a tactic that I use all the time is when somebody calls me up about that, I invite them into my office. Let's talk about it. But I want to talk about the next project. I don't want to talk about this one. And depending upon the reaction of the particular rep who's calling me, it tells me everything. If they don't want to talk about the next project, they're just trying to figure out how to make a sale for today, we don't have time for each other. If they do want to talk about the next project, then I can be looking at it. Keeping in mind, if I accept the substitution, I have the same legal responsibility as if I originally specified it. So I need to know that that particular product is going to work on this particular project. And it's really late in the game when we're making those decisions. And in fact, I'm going to say it's, in most cases, too late. So my question back to the audience here would be, do you want to be the trusted advisor, the golden rep, or do you want to be, as some in my profession look at it, do you want to be a peddler and a spec buster? And if you just let to make a sale for today, we're not going to have time for each other. If you want to take time to educate me, I'm willing to listen all day long. I think we're going to stay here for a moment, guys, because we have questions piling up in the chat box. Now, the next one that has come in is from Jason, and he says, what team member is best to approach? The project manager? The spec writer? And you started to say, Paul, that you kind of have your hand on everything, but you're an independent spec writer in your case. Right. And as an independent, you, when I worked inside large firms, and I was the head of technical resources, and I was the head of specifications, I could put my hand down and say, we're not doing that. As an independent consultant, I don't do that. I, uh, instead of making dictates, we make suggestions. And if I'm, and that's how I say it. And if I'm sitting where you're sitting, this is what I'd be doing and thinking. Uh, and I'm going to suggest you think that as opposed to, we're not doing this. Well, we are doing this and, and we're done with it. Uh, so the uh, project manager, and again, I'm going to talk about large firms, is probably a business guy. He is an architect, but he is more concerned about uh, staffing and uh, billing and manpower and hourly projections as opposed to the project architect who is the person who's really running the job and making those decisions. But if it's, it's, again, a larger project and a larger firm, there's probably a head designer involved. Uh, the designer may be looking at particular products, but I get this all the time. This is the product we would like to use, but it's a public project. I need two others just like it. What are they? Well, sometimes that's easy. 
and sometimes that's not. And um, I like to say to people, I know a lot about a lot, but I don't know everything about anything. And I look at the audience here as you are the folks who do know everything about your particular product line. And that's why I need to trust you to get answers. Well, and I'll add one thing to that, Paul, that makes a lot of sense because that happens to me quite a bit. I'll go in and I'll do the education process on a relatively new line of products, and the last thing the architect will ask as I'm headed out the door is, hey, I need to have a couple other products out here. Who's your competition? Now, it's easy to give them the lower end of the competition. Like you said, Paul, you have one chance to lie to me. It's easy to give them two products that aren't exactly the same, and it's easy to defend at bid time or when the contractor gets involved and tries to start squeezing some money out of the project. But I always try to give them what I consider to be the top two competitive products that they have so they have the most likely way to reach their design intent because of the fiscal responsibility that you have because that way you're covered. And then it's up to me as a product rep to follow the job through the bid process and make sure that I follow it through to the right GC or the right contractor and that's where I actually will have to make the sale. But I don't even get that opportunity if I haven't done my work at your level first. And I'd like to jump in on that. That is, I'm asking uh, my trusted advisors all the time uh, uh, who's your good competition because it comes down to do you want to select them, who your good competition is, or do you want me to do it and my, I'm going to do it based out of ignorance and I'm going to go to some website someplace for products that look like uh, similar things but may not perform as well. And so here's an opportunity for you, when, and I know sometimes it can be annoying. Architects asking me to name two other people who do what I do or two other products that will do what this can do, and I don't necessarily want to do that. <clears throat> Is your opportunity to come up with good competition versus giving me an opportunity to pick some lousy products that you're going to have to then compete against and you're not going to win. So I think it's in your best interest to pick competitive products that will perform as well. It's a win-win uh, for everybody, and, uh, and then if you're competitive in the marketplace, hopefully it turns out well for you. You'll have a supporter in me, I'll tell you that. Now, Paul, we have a question here. Most early designs are generic, meaning nonspecific. How do we interact with the design team at this early stage? It's good to let the design team know you're around. Uh, that's one. Let them know what you have that can perform. Um, and, and let me just take a generic type of thing, and I'm going to say generic in some respect, but like metal metal wall panels or even metal roofing. Uh, it comes in all flavors and sizes. It can be uh, sheet metal. It can be composite. It can be metal plate. It uh, can be aluminum. It can be uh, galvalume. It can be stainless steel, titanium. Um, and, and again, the, all flavors. Uh, but letting the design team know early when they just think they're going to use some sort of metal panel, what you have available, and be there as an assistant to them to go through the design process, which can be a pain in the neck, I admit. We want to see samples. We want to see colors. We want to see all those type of things. But when you're the one supply, supplying all that information, you tend to be the person who will end up, or the product line that will end up in the specifications as the basis of design. And when we list products as a basis of design, that's what the architect would really like to have. And oh, by the way, here's a couple other that we feel are uh, competitive or, or complementary to what's been specified. Uh, so if we have to list those three, we have a basis of design and two others. But the basis of design gets the more emphasis but the documentation has been written around it. Now we have a comment here and we have people are talking about lunch and learns now as a way to open a relationship. So I'm going to read the comment and insert it here. And this is from Scott. This discussion alludes to the fact that manufacturer reps need to put in the needed time to meet with AE firms first. This includes offering AIA CEU seminars and general meet and greets. Relationships take time, just like a job's life cycle, before the ROI of one's time can be realized in the form of a quote-unquote sale. Manufacturers' representatives' primarily, primary objective is to be the technical resource when the spec writers and design teams need you. 
I agree with the panel. They ought not approach a firm about a particular project. And yet that's so often how the, the question is worded, Scott. Uh, how do I get in on this particular project? I think what we're getting at here is you need to have an ongoing relationship with these folks, and it must be trust-based. A quote that I like to use a lot is, um, is a wonderful educator, uh, Marva Collins, who once said that if you um, give a person a fish, they'll eat for a day. But if you give them a pole with a hook, They'll learn to eat forever. And I like to use that quote when I'm talking to reps and saying, are you trying to make a sale for today? Here today, gone tomorrow. Or are you in this business because this is not just a job. This is your vocation. This is your livelihood. This is what you want to do. You're here because you love doing what you want to do. And make sales for the rest of your life by building these relationships and being in every specification that goes out. So I'm into the relationship building, education, and then you'll be there. You don't even need to make the sales calls after a while. But it takes a while to get there, like in anything else. So this isn't, uh, I'm looking stuff up in the yellow pages uh, or going down to Home Depot to buy something. Uh, we're going to uh, be looking in relationship building uh, as uh, the trusted advisor or the golden rep, the go-to person that we're going to call. And it takes time. Yes, it does. It takes an investment. But if you're into this for the long haul, it's an investment that will pay dividends for as long as you're doing it. Now, we have a question here, and Thad might be the best guy to take this one. What is the best way to make an introduction to a firm you do not have a contact in? Do you need a specific project to reference, or can you just show up and say, how can I add value? And Holly is asking this. Well, Paul said it earlier. You have one chance to make a first impression. Choose wisely. A cold car probably isn't your best bet. No. Architects are like anybody else. Um, I saw a survey once, I don't know where it's at now, um, where they're at now on this, but you know, uh, an architect will get 12 or 14 unsolicited phone calls a day. In the larger market, they might have two or three people that stop by without an appointment. If, if I, for any reason, feel necessary to stop by without an appointment, I expect to talk to the person at the front desk and it's going to be a short visit. If I'm going to talk to a firm that I don't know well, that I haven't had a chance to network somewhere with CSI or AIA somewhere to be able to get in to make a contact, uh, my point of contact typically is through a project because all of us have to make money. And if they can move a billable hour for talking about a project where I feel like I could add some value, that's great. But again, that always comes with a phone call and a request. Do you have 15 minutes to talk to me? Do you have 10 minutes to talk to me? Sometimes I'll even say, do you have eight minutes you can spare me? Because eight minutes is so much different than everybody says, we have 15 minutes, and sometimes 15 minutes means, well, I'm going to stand here for a half hour and drone on about how wonderful I am and my product is. If I say eight minutes, that's an unusual time. And then when I enter their office or when I enter their space, and typically at those times, if you don't have the contact, it's not unusual for the fellow to walk out to you and see you in the lobby. Basically, that's his way of saying, I'm going to make sure that I want to see you. I'm going to make sure that you don't take too much of my time. Even if I'm in his office, I will not sit down until ask. And then I keep an eye on the clock. And if that first call, if all I get is eight minutes and I leave after seven, I've made an impression, a positive impression. Now, Paul, that's how I feel. Do you feel the same way? I do. And, and another story I like to tell when I relocated from uh, Dallas to Baltimore and has the head of specifications in a, a large firm and my boss at that particular time was the head of technical resources and says I uh, scheduled an appointment with a guy you need to see him I'm too busy I can't talk to him this particular day uh, that uh, <clears throat> he's the best rep in the whole region and you really need to get to know him and at the appointed time he showed up on time and I went up there and he started talking, and after about five minutes, I'm starting to squirm a little bit. After 10 minutes, I got hackles coming up on my neck, and after 15 minutes, 
I had to excuse myself from this particular conversation. <clears throat> this was a, a, a rep that could sell uh, screen doors and put them on submarines. He had uh, vinyl windows that could go up on uh, Skylab uh, and work in outer space. <clears throat> Never had a problem in anything. Um, and, and I'm scratching my head because here's my boss that I respect telling me I need to meet this guy. And when I walked back into our office suite, everybody busted out laughing. This is a particular rep that nobody wants to talk to, nobody wants to meet. And they all said, gotcha, new guy, welcome to Baltimore. <clears throat> so uh, this was a particular rep made a lasting impression that nobody wanted to talk to him ever. Uh, and that, and I'd see him every year at the uh, CSI convention picking up new product lines because he couldn't hold them for more than a year. Because nobody would ever specify his product because of the rep. So again, making first impressions and and not talk about when you've got that eight minutes and that's all about the eight different product lines you're carrying. Go in there with a focus. Educate. The focus should be education, not sales, not marketing. Well, we now have we still have a stack of questions coming in, gentlemen. And we have a lot of questions coming in generally about communication and what sort of communication are we looking for. So Adam Olson is asking, how would you recommend to build the relationship beyond the lunch and learn? Binders are dead. Websites are not human interaction. Any suggestions at all? Well, lunch and learns, again, when I uh, was the director of specifications and technical resources at this particular firm, I would say to people coming in, first of all, you have to get through me, I'm the gatekeeper. Uh, and once I'm convinced, I said, you've already done the marketing and the sales. Now go educate my staff. Now, the complaint that I hear oftentimes, and this is true, uh, there's a lot of young people, non-decision makers out there, but the non-decision maker is the decision maker of the future. If you spend your time educating people, this is what our product is, this is what it can do, this is what it cannot do. Uh, in this particular environment, if you go into a different part of the country, there are limitations. Call me about what they are. Uh, build that relationship. Offer to stay, uh, and I'm sure all of you do this, is that when the lunch and learn is over, don't pack up and run off. Uh, you'll field your questions at the end, and then you can talk specifically about uh, the product and how long it's been in business, and and that's when you can do a little bit more marketing when people come to you with a project specific question um, and that's when you really can start honing in on things um, we talked earlier a little bit about cold calls at best if you were even uh, brought into a meeting I like that you have about a 20% opportunity that whatever you're marketing that particular day is what's needed to the person you're talking to that's a one in five cold calls are not very effective uh, so again, finding decision makers, and it takes time. Uh, join CSI. Go to CSI meetings. Find out who the firms are in the area, who the decision makers are. And again, it's networking. And then if you decide that uh, you, for whatever reason, whether you're going to change uh, companies you're working for, you still have your network. No matter where you go, there you are. And the things you'll never lose are your network and your knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, Joy, I got a call recently from a specifier at a large firm in Chicago. They were looking to add another person and they had a couple resumes from architects and this fella, this this specifier had noticed I was a LinkedIn, I was joined in LinkedIn with one of the candidates. And he called me for my opinion. He goes, what's your opinion of this person? Now, I've never worked in an architectural office, but again, those are the types of relationships that I feel like you can only forge through groups like CSI, where you work hand in hand on different projects, uh, whether it's a trade show, it's a golf outing, whatever it is, just a regular meeting with another with an architect, and they see you in a different light. They get to see your entire personality, and they know whether they can trust what you say or not. They know if you think alike. Now we have we have a tip from an audience member. Um, one of the most useful things that I have found, writes Chris, as a technical support for a manufacturer is LinkedIn and in interacting in the groups, listening to what these groups are looking for from reps. 
So what he's really saying is don't just start a LinkedIn account and link to a bunch of people at firms and never talk to them again, but actually participate in the LinkedIn groups and look to see what people are discussing. And every week we post a question with a pro group just to create that kind of discussion. So thank you, Chris. You were not a plant, but you helped me promote the LinkedIn group. There are also, gentlemen, a lot of different ways to communicate now, and we're in a time of tremendous change. So we have people who want binders and people who don't want anything, elect anything paper whatsoever. They've gone entirely electronic. And it's becoming confusing to decide how to approach someone and in what way. What do you guys say to that? Well, let, let me tie this in. I, I'll take the first stab at it, and then I'll turn it over to Paul. Let me tie this into a com the question that was asked by Adam earlier. You know, regular and continued communication. You know, something as simple as an electronic newsletter to all of your architectural contact contacts, or in some sort of an e-blast, regardless of whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, email, whichever with fits best with your clientele and the different people that you feel like you're a trusted advisor for, or you'd like to become a trusted advisor, products change, testing changes, limitations change, and if you're a specifier, like Paul said earlier, there's 60 or 70,000 product, products on a job, and you know a little bit about all of them, not a lot about any of them, and so it's important for us as product reps to make sure that we communicate the changes to those people so that they can make best use of our products. If you're an architect, and, I'll, and then I'll pass it to you, Paul, I can only imagine if you got some sort of an update on a product that you really like, the roofing products that you talked about earlier, that you saw there was some sort of a change that was either positive or detrimental, I think that would be of great interest to you. That's absolutely true. Um, and I get calls every day, put me in your spec, put me in your spec. I have yet to have that call, take me out of your spec, no longer, we're no longer in business. Uh, but what, the, the, going and, and jumping on what the dad said earlier, what can make you stand out from the competition if you have comparable products and, and communication? And I don't care what business you think we are in, we are in a communication business, uh, is paramount. Standards and, and products are changing every day, and there's no way I can stay abreast of all that. And I'm coming back to education again. If you had a newsletter that came out on a monthly basis and said, here's changes that are happening in the industry, here are shortcomings that we have discovered, or here are code changes and how we're going to meet them, um, that is stuff that is, you've got my attention. I have to look at that stuff. And if, and if you're constantly in front of me with this type of information, you become my first thought of who to go to when we have questions on a project. Yeah, they're sitting at that newsletter that day going to make a sale? Probably not. But over a period of time, and, and the awareness and the recognition of it, it pays dividends. It's got to. Um, I think what you're both getting at here, and I want to highlight this because I work in the marketing end of things. Frequency of contact is important and the warmth of the relationship is important. But what really matters is every time you contact someone, you have to have a reason that they consider valuable for doing it. The information you're sharing must be valuable to them. This is the difference between spam and important communication. It's what the audience receiving the information thinks of it, not what you think when you're sending it. So what do you do? You figure out what you can share that's going to matter to someone and help them get their job done, and that's what you focus on. And if you don't have anything like that to talk about or to share, you don't want to try to attract their attention because you're just going to annoy them. You're just going to be spamming them. Okay, I'm actually going to advance the slides, guys. This, by the way, what's up here right now is the very simplified answer to that question. And it's the one you should keep in mind if you're studying for the CDT. Now, can the, boy, I think we covered this, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Can the internet do a product representative's job? <laughs> and for the sake of time, I'm going to say no, it can't. And that's because architects need someone to solve a very specific problem for them. And as wonderful as Google is right now, it still can't figure out how to solve Paul's very specific problem on a Tuesday afternoon with a particular project. 
and here's what a lot of our questions were getting at. Uh, what if the architect won't talk to you? Paul? I have a very simple solution. Uh, if, if you're spending a lot of time trying to get into a particular firm and nobody will return your call, uh, shake your feet, dust the, take the dust off your sandals and walk on. Uh, if they don't appreciate what you do, then they're not worthy of your time. And spend your time where you, people who do respect you and trust you, and, uh, and, and that's where you need to be. And you don't need to be a friend to every architect in town. Matter of fact, I know a lot of architects that don't want to spend any time with you until 11 o'clock on a Friday night when they got a job that has to go out Monday morning. Um, and that's when they go to the internet. So uh, they don't, uh, they want what they want when they want it. Many architects. Now I am an architect, so I can talk about that. Uh, but I also have come to appreciate uh, the, all the information, the wealth of information that I don't know. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to say I don't know what I don't know, but you can help me with that. What don't I know that I need to know for a particular product in a particular project in a particular location? Uh, but then I need to know enough to call you. So, and that's the conundrum. How do you get to that point where uh, I'm just going to do that? I went back earlier to say uh, there's many ways of communication and contact, and it's not always a phone call or meeting me face to face in an office. And it's not CSI meetings. You tell me something over the phone. You tell me something in a meeting. Uh, I might remember some of it. I'm not going to remember all of it. But if you send me uh, a follow up communication, this is what we talked about in an email. I can save that email and come back to it later. I can, that's just sending out newsletters. I have a couple different folders that I keep on my computer, one for products that I put product information into, and one for standards, when standards are changing, or codes are changing, um, and, I, and I put information in there. So I can always go back to it, and that's a form of communication. Gee, where did this come from? It came from XYZ company, and they're staying in front of me, and. Uh, keeping me abreast of the changes that are happening uh, out there, and, and that's all good stuff. So, and I can capture that and, and hold on to it. Again, the architects that don't talk to you and won't talk to you, march on. Fad, any thoughts on that? Well, you don't even want me to get started on that. No, I would <laughs> say that I agree exactly with what Paul says. Well, my first thought about that, actually, based on some of the stories I've heard from my friends here in Albuquerque, is just because they didn't call you when the project was under construction doesn't mean they won't be forced to call you after the project is completed, the building is occupied, and they discover that they should have called you in the first place. And I, w I, will, I will add to that, Joy. That makes a lot of sense. It's not unusual to get those calls when an architect or a contractor specifically, more a contractor, is in trouble, the first thing you say is, thank you for calling me, even if it's a problem with a product, because we all make products that sometimes don't perform as designed. So you have the opportunity to say thank you, because nobody reaches out unless they care enough to try to solve the problem. But working on a problem, whether it's yours or someone else's, some of my best architectural friends are, are my best architectural friends because they reached out to me after they used a different product and they had problems and I was and I helped them solve it and now I'm the go-to guy. Yes, use your opportunities to teach gently and wisely. Now, this is something I'm getting a lot of questions about so I wanted to make sure we got to at least this question. What is the contractor's relationship to the project and to me as a product rep? Thad, do you want to try that one? Uh, as a former contractor, I can tell you that the contractor only cares about you if you provide a better product that's less expensive or that makes his job easier. Yes, he's going to remember every single product that was difficult to install that required complicated and time-consuming installation that cost him a lot of money or that in any other way made his part of the project not go well and he's the guy who's doing execution. Paul, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, lots of them. 
uh, <laughs> and, and again, let's talk about the uh, contractor's relationship deals with, first of all, what's the delivery method? Is it, a, is it a bid project? Is it a negotiated project with a construction manager type? Is it a design build project? Every one of those can be a little different. Um, but getting into, um, I mean, and there's like architects, there are good ones and bad ones, but as far as contractors go, uh, and, and I love the contractor who uh, is diligent about their job, not just trying to find the uh, cheapest one that they can get put in quickly. Uh, and, and here's one of the stories I love telling because it's a true story. Uh, and working with one of my golden reps on a large skylight project in a mall in Florida that the uh, contractor, who was a friendly contractor, good contractor, came to me and he said, we'd like to substitute a different product. We can get it quicker and it's going to save the owner <clears throat> $380,000. And $380,000 where I come from is uh, not jump change, something we pay attention to. And it, But the, from what I knew about this particular manufacturer they wanted to use, he was on my B team list, a smaller project. This was a large mall, had a lot of skylight on it. So what do I do? I go to the guy that I spent two days working with developing the specification and the details for the project my golden rim, my trusted advisor, and I call him up and said, you know, this is something i got to pay attention to, uh, but what's your opinion of your competition here? And this, to me, epitomizes what a golden rep is. Didn't smash the competition, didn't bad back the competition, simply said, there's a few things, I think, questions you need to ask. One, we had a non-thrusting condition, first of all, we had metal studs for our curve going around this thing. And the design called for the ridge of the skylight to take all the thrust up there uh, because the curve couldn't resist it. Can they do it? If not, you have to change curves. See, now this is that ripple effect that I'm talking about in substitutions. <clears throat> if you change the product, you'll have to change something else to accommodate that particular product. That's not being thought about right now. So he's asking me to think through this entire process. Then call this other contractor 20 miles down the road and worked on a project down there and asked them about the quality of the shop drawings that the, this particular substituted material or the one being considered submitted for it, asked about timeliness of delivery and performance of the installation. And went back to my contractor, said, I think we need to do a little due diligence here, do some studying. Asked this. First of all, they couldn't take out the thrust of the, at the ridge we have to change up our whole curve. That's a redesign type of thing. But more importantly, the contractor called me back and said, just kidding, we're withdrawing it, the project down the road. The uh, shop drawings were submitted five times before they were finally approved. The installation was two months late, which meant they couldn't get weathered in. And then after it was installed, it leaked like a sieve. Contractors don't want that. They don't want to be bothered with that. And so here's a contractor, again, keeping tabs, not on a project they did, but they'll talk to other contractors, just like specifiers talk to one another, contractors talk to one another on performance of products. So, do it right. Now, Joy, one other now, thing. Paul, uh, hold on, Thad. Um, I want to first explain this slide. If you are studying for the CDT or the CCPR exam, you will need to know this part of it. And you want to make sure that when they start talking about contractor relationships and they're talking about the contracts, you can tell the difference between these variations. Now, we have a question and I'm pretty sure Paul wants to answer this question, Pat. <laughs> if the architect does not get back to you, is it okay to go to the owner directly to sell your product? That is one of the biggest no-no's uh, you can do. Uh, but I'm going to give you another example and this is another true story. <clears throat> uh, well, explain why it's a no-no. It's a no-no. It, it's a uh, uh, go to the architect. The architect, first of all, is responsible for the performance of the product. But sometimes an owner will make a decision for the architect. This is the product you're going to use, and this is the scenario that I'm given right now. I got a phone call after the project was out on the street. <clears throat> he said, we were not included in the specifications for the roof on this project. And I said, that's right after I asked, who are you, and what are you selling? Uh, he came back to me and he, he said, we're selling such and such a roof product. I said, you're right, you're not included, uh, and besides that, you won't be. 
so I said, but you don't understand, we got the subcontract in this. And I said, I don't care if you got the subcontract, you are not supplying material in this, I will not approve it. And after this went back and forth for six, seven minutes of this type of uh, uh, speech, uh, he finally came back to me and said, what you don't understand is that the owner is my brother-in-law and that we are going to put the roof on this building. I said, good luck with that. Ten minutes later, I get a phone call from guess who? Brother-in-law, the owner of the building. He said, you have to put this product on there. And then we went back and forth about the, you don't understand type of thing. And, and then I finally said to the owner, you, you need to understand when, not if, but when this product fails and it starts leaking, just don't call me. He said, but you don't understand. He sleeps with my sister. I've got to do this. And I said, finally, you're the boss. You can do what you want. And then I wrote a two-page letter and I sent it off to the owner. I said, we will do this under the rest. <clears throat> we are not uh, approving this product. Uh, you can do what you want, but when it fails, don't call us. And then the owner finally called us back and said, just kidding, that once he had a letter in writing saying that he was going to go against the advice of his design professional, uh, whom he hired to not only design but to consult, uh, looking out for his interests, you've got to protect you from you sometimes, and also recognizing that this guy had a board of directors he had to answer to, he, he finally said, I gotta give in on this one. But so again, relationships and, and there are certain things that architects aren't gonna back down from, or at least good uh, there's a certain threshold that we just don't cross. That because of liability issues, we don't wanna and I've had owners say that you should have not in these words, but you should have protected me from me. That's what I'm paying you for. So, and again, the relationships that are on the slide in front of you, if it's design, bid, bill, the uh, bidder has the obligation to bid the documents as they're written. In a negotiated contract, uh, oftentimes the uh, contractors on board during the design phase give an input and has a lot of influence over what something may be done and good uh, uh, value engineering occurring during the design process is when it should happen. If I go down to design build, in that particular case, the builder oftentimes is telling the designer what to do. Because they've already committed to a price and now they're set the price points and and, and that's a good bad. I've been working very good design build projects and I've worked in horrible design build projects for that reason. And then the owner builds, the owner is building the project themselves, they can pretty much do what they want. So one, one additional comment to wrap up on what Paul just said, because the question was, what is the contractor's relationship to the product and project and to me? If you're in those types of scenarios, just exactly what Paul said, there's times where the builder is actually moving forward and directing the designer. In that case, one of the most important things, and I'll wrap this back to one of the questions that was asked earlier, what if the architect won't talk to me? If the architect has never talked to you, doesn't even know who you are, and yet gets excellent submittals with perfect documentation that was supplied by the product rep to the contractor and a little bit of coaching from the product rep to make sure that the process goes smoothly once it hits the architect and they have all the information they need, the architect is going to notice and they're going to go back and go, okay, who is this guy? I want to meet him. Or who is this girl? I want to meet this person. They've made my job easier and given me my design intent of all the support I need. Well, gentlemen, I had warned you that five minutes before the hour, I was going to wrap this up. So we're now 60 seconds before the hour. <laughs> and Paul, I think we, we set a new record for not getting through the slides. Aren't you proud of us? Oh, jeepers. <laughs> Didn't think we would. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to jump to the end because there are a couple things we wanted to talk about before we called it a day. Okay. Uh, we wanted to let everyone know that the next webinar we have scheduled, we will have Nina Giglio and Mike Chambers, two of CSI's most popular speakers, both of them certified specifiers, talking about guide specifications. They both serve on CSI's compliant document review program where you can have your guide specs reviewed. And they have some interesting advice for everyone, so I'm looking forward to that. And we also wanted to talk for a minute. Uh, this was a free webinar, but CSI does education for product representatives all the time. And we've only scratched the surface of what CSI talks about in this presentation. 
So coming up, it's about to be the final registration deadline for our our um, certification exams. Both the CDT, which is a prerequisite to the CCPR exam, and the CCPR exam itself. So if you're interested in that, and Paul, what do you have to say about people who are certified? Well, certifiable, I mean, I have my, let me put it to you this way, there's, there's been a lot of questions and, and comments today about how do you get in front of an architect, how do you get them to pay attention. First of all, if you have CDT after your name with me, uh, I go, okay, this is really good because they already have an understanding of what I, what it is that I do and, and when the best time to make a lot of these things that we talked about today uh, are part of the CDT exam. Uh, but when I see CCPR, Certified Construction Product Representative, I stand up. I don't sit up and pay attention. I stand up and pay attention because you've gone the extra mile to uh, really understand not just what it is that we do, but what good product reps do all across the country. And then we also have our Product Representative Academy coming up, and it's going to be in Indianapolis this year, which is going to be exciting. And Thad, you're helping put that together. So what are you planning for that, for Product Representatives? What could they look forward to? Well, I have, I have questions all the time from people that say, uh, do I really want to come to this? I don't know. I, I might be too advanced for this. I might know too much. Well, you know, that's like saying you could be too good looking or have too much money. Uh, two things I'll never have to worry about, but most people could never have. The academies is basically like a mini MBA program for CSI. It's where we bring in some of the best of the best and we teach all the little tips and tricks in length in a day-long process similar to what we've talked about here. You know, you're going to hear people like Andy McIntyre, who's a CCPR, talk about how to do a killer box lunch. Uh, Atlanta Sun of Griffith is going to talk about building presentation skills and your reputation. You're going to learn how to get better, getting the most out of product shows and conventions, uh, how to be a golden rep with people like Chuck Thompson, who's been on the certification committee, and Pete Baker, who is also a CCPR in that market. You know, so we're going to get some local flavor from local people that call on architects every day, and we're going to bring in some people from across the country as well. We'll hear about sales etiquette. You know, We'll go blueprints to BIM. Do you really know what you're looking for? So there's a lot of content there. I urge everyone to go click on that link and make sure that they start. And actually, let me just say this. We haven't published the final program yet, but that'll happen here. We're going to start marketing here pretty quickly, Joy, as you probably know. And then the one, pro, the one program that I think is going to be very interesting to folks, and Paul might be able to talk about this too, yeah, we're going to do one on compensation. How do we all get paid? Because money drives the world, and what, how an architect office functions is different than how a product rep or an independent rep, and that will be a panel of several professionals all across three tracks. And the thing, I'd just like to jump in one second. The thing that's really important about this, and I've attended these and I've made presentations at them, that these are, this academy is put on by product reps for product reps. This isn't the architect's wish list for what a product rep would be. This is product reps talking about what they do every day, how they do it successfully. There's a lot to learn there. And they do bring in design professionals to talk about certain types of things. When's the best time to contact an architect? Uh, and, and what are the different design phases, the things that the architects do? But that's 5 to 10% of the whole thing. 80% of it's going to be product reps talking to product reps about how it has been successful for them. There are things to be learned. Good education. Now, the last thing on this slide is the Trusted Advisors day-long workshop, which we have never done before. And I am helping put that together with David Vaughn, a certified construction product representative here in the Southwest. We're going to be in Denver in May. And unlike the academies where you will also, you know, we talk about the PRA, but there are two other academies there where you will run into contract administrators and construction specifiers. So it's very mixed at the academies, and there's a lot of talk about roles and responsibilities. At the Trusted Advisor Workshop, it's just going to be product representatives, and we're going to have an open conversation about what's really happening to our reps out in the field today, the way the market looks now in this economy. I know that at least one of the topics that we are outlining for this presentation is ethics and integrity 
and maintaining yours under tremendous stress. We're also going to talk about how to rep some different kinds of products, some very specific advice based on what it is you're handling and who's most interested in it. So I'm looking forward to that too. Other than that, gentlemen, we have now gone over time. It is 3.05 p.m., so I want to let people go. But we also have some questions that have come in. So do you want to hang out and answer some questions that have come in? I'm one. Paul and Thad? Of course. Okay. And, and I'm really going to try not to let Paul and Thad go on for another hour. I'm going to put effort into that. <laughs> now let's see. Oh, and we have a CDT question. If I am currently registered to take the CDT exam, when do I need to register for the CCPR exam? Um, Amber, you take the CDT exam and you pass it, and then you register for the CCPR exam. You can't take them back to back because the CDT is prerequisite to the CCPR exam. Now, we have a question here, Paul. What about talking cost with the architect? Yes, <laughs> good thing to do. Uh, and I know that we're always interested in, uh, talk, in in the cost of a particular product, but I also recognize that most reps or uh, marketing products are not doing the installation, and the installation is a key component to a, a particular product's uh, total cost. Um, but I'm I'm generally looking for ballpark. Uh, what I'm not asking for anybody who's using a favored uh, installer or anything else like that. I need to have a ballpark figure for what something costs. Because part of the responsibility as a design professional, uh, we're given a budget too. And we have to design a project to be within budget. And here's something else you need to understand. If, if we're more than 10% over budget when it comes time to bid, we redesign for free. We don't get paid for it. So we have to have a, an understanding of uh, not only project types and how to do it, but the materials we're going to use and the relative cost of those materials to be considered. Cost is an important item there. Did you have any thoughts on that, Pat? No, his comment is exactly right. And, he, and let me just expound on it one, one little bit. The overall budget number, the general budget number is important because while I might be talking to him about one specific project, my thought process is always, if I'm in the master spec, if I'm the basis of design, if I'm the trusted advisor, I want him to know about what my product is going to cost for any project because I want that mind share on every project and not just this one. And being a little more expensive is okay if you get more better durability. Now again, this depends upon the project. I learned this the hard way. Uh, I do a lot of university work, hard use, long life uh, cycles, and um, we generally try to specify better quality products simply because they're going to last longer. But I've had a developer client once who said to me, I don't care about uh, the durability and the longevity of it. We're going to sell this project in two years after it's built. I just need something to get me through that two years, and then it's going to be the new owner's problem. So. I don't want the most expensive thing. I get rewarded on first cost, not longevity. And uh, that was an eye-opening experience for me early in my career, too, of understanding the right product for the right project. Now, another question we got that I did not get us to. Is it practical or realistic to ask the design team to make your product exclusive, in parentheses, sole source, excluding other OEMs? Yeah. Well, you can always ask. <laughs> I, I say you can always ask. Don't expect. Um, and, and the issue that we have with sole sourcing things oftentimes is that when you take the competition away, the costs generally, and this is a general statement, generally go up. Uh, and we don't necessarily want the owner to be paying a premium for a product that we really would like them to have. This is what we really like. And I'm going to be honest with you, one of the things that I do oftentimes when working with a uh, negotiated contract or something like that, we put other good, quote, competition in there just to keep you honest, price-wise. I mean, we're not looking for anybody to go to the poorhouse. What we're looking for is a good product that's going to last, and everybody is going to make some money, but nobody should be making a killing. And we find that when in a, what we call it is a closed proprietary specification where 
uh, there is no competition, the costs generally go up. And that's what we uh, try to avoid. Dad, did you have anything you wanted to say? You know, from a product rep standpoint, uh, one quick comment is we all have places in the country where we fit better than our competition, even our good competition. There are advantages in freight, there are advantages in sustainability. You know, so the golden rep will know where they fit the best and they will know what makes the most sense for what project in what part of the country. And those are other ways that you can aid the architect as well by pointing them out to them. And so they know, the architect knows all the way through the project. And again, it comes back to mind share. You want to make sure that you're in their mind in a certain part of the country where you have an advantage if that's the case. Paul's point is an, an excellent one. They want the most competitive price they can get. But there are places where we all know as product reps you can have the most competitive price and still make more money than your competition. The good reps know that and they know how to make that happen. And then we had a question we didn't get to earlier from Chris. And I want you guys to pay attention to the use of the term systems here, because that's where I paused. Do you find an AIA presentation helpful for systems that will be part of a project? Now, I took systems in that use from Chris. Chris is the one who's asking this. To be something other than an isolated product. I'll jump on that one. Uh, I'm currently the head of the Building and Technology Education Program. Uh, it's a feasibility study to go forward with better understanding of how uh, buildings are put together. And one of the things that I state all the time in my 30 plus years of experience is that um, buildings are not a compilation of pieces and parts. They are systems and assemblies. They have to work together. So if there's a system that works better than putting together a bunch of independent pieces and parts, which we hope are going to work. Uh, I'm always ready to pay attention to that. Uh, when I get into the shop drawing phase of a stage and I get this and, uh, and a particular product is being specified but where it touches another product, there's always the by others. And then you look at the other product and the gap between the two is by others. And I want to know who's the by others. I wish I owned the by others construction company because I'd be on every job. And that's the interface of those particular pro products uh, where problems usually occur. Product A is usually very good, product B is very good, and where they come together is an absolute dismal failure because there was either incompatibility of material uh, or somebody didn't feel something right. Uh, so a system that has worked through all of this is always preferable. But again, in the big picture of things, needs to be within the same type of budget and work. In fact, it makes my job easier if I have a whole assembly or a system. Fab, was there anything you wanted to say? Well, you are so brave. We're over on time already. You keep giving me, handing me the ball. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the bottom line is just exactly what Paul said, and, and the question is a great one. The golden reps, the, be the trusted advisors, know which assemblies fit together the best and where their product fits in those assemblies. And so if you can guide the architect and let them know on the front end, and that comes back to an earlier question we had about when is it too early or too late to get in the process. If you've educated the architect and given them the understanding of where you fit in those assemblies as they get those transition points, you've won a huge win. Now we've got a we've got another question, and you're right. I'm a brave person, bad, but there there are enough people sitting here listening that I think we'll continue to talk. If you need to go, folks, I will completely understand. Uh, the question is: Is it then crucial for a product rep to use and or understand building information modeling since it is categorized as a project delivery system? I guess you're shooting that one in my. I mean, my <laughs> way. I mean, my way. <laughs> well, I think this gets back to the communication and the technology that we're using is changing so rapidly. Yeah, it is, and, and part of that is building information modeling is still in its infancy. 
uh, I still haven't seen the true uh, value when I say what it can be is it, not being realized yet. Uh, when we talk about BIM, we're, today most people say Revit, yeah, the term Revit, which is 3D modeling. And 3D modeling is not BIM. Uh, BIM is when you're taking all the information and integrating it into the model. Um, when we have specifications in there, when CAT first came out, manufacturers were huge on helping put together uh, design sets that could be incorporated into a CAD model or a CAD uh, deal. I think it's a little more difficult with them when you're starting to say uh, product A and product B. Again, with modeling, I think the advance in the industry is good because uh, architects are having a better understanding how buildings get put together. You think that's our job? It is. Um, but because of the advent of CAD and, and Revit and, uh, and modeling, a lot of time that I spent learning how to put the buildings together today uh, after my generation, um, a lot of architects are learning how to use CAD instead of learning how to put buildings together, learning how to use Revit and convert CAD to Revit instead of uh, learning how to put buildings together. The good news is with the modeling is that you have to learn how to put buildings together or the model doesn't work. And if you can't build a model, you can't build a building. So we're coming around, but we're still not integrating the information into that model. And, uh, and how that's going to look in the very end, is it going to be... Uh, I mean, I've always envisioned when you click on a door, it'll tell you how big that door is, what the fire rating is, what the hardware is going to be for, we're not there yet. Um, but I think we can be exporting things because the model gets too big, it gets unmanageable. Uh, it takes, uh, you, we all know when we work on a computer sometimes, when you click on something and then you want to click on something else and it takes three minutes to get over there. That's what happens if you embed the model with too much information. Uh, so we're going to be collecting external links, I think, initially, until the horsepower is there. But it's coming, and, uh, and it's going to be good when we get there, finally. Dad, was there anything you wanted to say? I couldn't add anything to that. He did a great job. <laughs> Neither could I. Well, guys, we, we have run out of questions. I think we're good. So I think we can call this a meeting. Thank you so much for sharing what you know and helping us with this presentation, Thad and Paul. I really well, appreciate I, it. I do appreciate everybody who attended just because uh, hopefully if you learn came away with one thing, it'll make you a little better on what you do um, come tomorrow morning, and it was well worth it for everybody. Agreed. Anyone that was here, hopefully they picked something up, and thank you very much for your attendance. Okay, yeah, I'm going to call it, folks. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.